Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Tom Izu. I'm the Executive Director of the California History Center, the Anza College, and I'm also a member of the Advisory Board of the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. I wish to welcome all of you, especially those of you who might be here at the museum for the first time. Um, we really appreciate your attendance today. First, before I start, um, and I definitely have to do this because we have a very special volunteer standing at the door back there who I know will <laughs> be very upset if I don't do this, but we have to do an in-flight and theater safety talk. <laughs> please, please take note of the exits. If there is an emergency, you can go out the exit you came in, and there's also an exit back here. Um, calmly make your way down through the, sec the first floor and out to the parking lot. The bathrooms are downstairs if you haven't had a chance to visit them. And please silence your phones. Okay, is that all right, Rick? One other thing, uh, mm -hmm. in the event of an actual earthquake, uh, we ask that you please don't get up and try to run for a door. Uh, it's not really safe to move over uneven ground when things may be falling on you. What we ask that you do is get on the floor, cover up your head, and hunker down underneath something that will break fall, like if a light picture or something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, as you see, he's in charge of safety for Japantown. <laughs> the museum received a grant from the California Civil Liberties Public Education Program of the State Library, which was established to educate the public about the World War II mass incarceration of Japanese Americans and the massive violence, violations of the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights. This forced expulsion and imprisonment, imprisonment represents. The program's goal is to promote important lessons about civil liberties that can be gleaned from this history. For our project, the museum is collaborating with my center at Danza College and Jake Japantown Community TV to make these lessons relevant and powerful so we may face the political storm engulfing our entire nation right now, one fueled by fear and hate mongering and scapegoating against immigrants and Muslim Americans in particular. We decided to focus our project on the Japantown community and use the lens of local and regional history to make connections between two communities to start with, Chinese Americans and Mexican Americans. And those two communities, as you will learn, have shared this exact area you know, with the Japanese Americans. We want to draw important parallels with each community's own historical experience, of facing exclusionary actions and the fear and hate mongering in the past. We have conducted interviews and will record public programs like this one. Um, this is being the second one we've done to capture these stories. Our first event held last month to use the history of Mexican Americans and repatriation campaign of the 1930s that resulted in the deportation of well over 1 million Mexican Americans, with an estimated 70% being U.S.-born children. Through this project, we wish to encourage the creation of more opportunities to share and connect and help our communities work together to face this most urgent situation. At this time, I wish to recognize Brenda He Wong, president of the board of the Chinese Historical and Cultural Project of San Jose, which is one of the groups we will be working with in the future. Where's Brenda? Oh, okay. Wave and everything. Um, if, if you're not familiar with this organization, please talk with Brenda during our reception. I know there's some other members of that organization here as well. Speaking of which, please note the gold lease. Maybe you're sitting on one right now. We will be asking all of you to write words of inspiration for building unity between our communities on them and share them in an art project display during our reception after the program. So smooth them out and keep them handy or you can steal your neighbors if you can't find it. No, we have extra ones. Um, our focus this evening is on the Chinese American community, a connection we make with Japanese Americans and civil liberties lessons by the simple statement, don't exclude us, here to stay. Our San Jose Japanese American community has a very special connection, especially to the here to stay part. Before San Jose Japan town, there was Heinlandville Chinatown, just a few blocks away. Built after one of the largest Chinatowns on the West Coast, located in downtown San Jose, was burned to the ground in 1887 in an act of arson, fueled by a virulent anti-Chinese movement, leading to an extreme act of exclusion, the violent destruction of an entire community. John Heinlein, a supportive fellow immigrant from Germany, 
helped local Chinese Americans build a new Chinatown here, dubbed Heinlandville. Early Japanese immigrants found a new home in Heinlandville neighborhood, along with Filipino Americans, both groups and welcome in most other parts of San Jose. And they created what local historian Connie Young Yu says was one of the first Asian American neighborhoods anywhere. Heinlandville came to an end in 1931, and later became known as what we call Japantown. And in regards to this, we'd like to show a very short video made by our project program manager, Judy Dang, who's hiding over here. And as I said, we are doing interviews, um, oral history-related interviews, and so this is extracted from one of the interviews we did. And it's Connie Young Yu, local historian, some of you knew, some of you know, and she's out of town, so she couldn't be here, but we thought her presence was very important. So if you can turn the lights off. <laughs> big test for all of us. You know, how we will behave when this is happening. What would we do to make a difference? How can we stop it? But like the Women's March, and you see so many Chinese Americans, you know, I know my, I was there, my children were there, my grandchildren were there, um, and uh, we just feel, okay, we just have to show. That's the first thing you do. You speak out, you know, you demonstrate, you put your body out there, and then you start, you know, looking at what are the other ways. You know, we're looking, okay, the next election, when's it going to be? You know, you have <coughs> candidates that you can back who, who will defend the, our people. You're excluded from immigration, you're excluded from naturalization. You're, you should be excluded from history because you're not part of America. That's why we rely on, on oral history. That's why it's so important. special guest who will help us understand some of the historic parallels between our communities and help us put it all into a historical context, linking the past to the present. Bill Ong Hing is a professor of law at the University of San Francisco and professor emeritus, UC California Davis School of Law. He teaches immigration policy, I really like this class, rebellious <laughs> lawyering, do you still teach that? <laughs> and negotiation and evidence. Throughout his career, he has pursued social justice by combining community work, litigation, and scholarship. He is the author of numerous academic and practice-oriented books and articles on immigration policy and community lawyering. He, is also, what, he was also co-counsel in the pres, precedent-setting Supreme Court asylum case, INS versus Cardoza Fonseca, 1987. Professor Hing is a founder of and continues to volunteer as general counsel for the Immigrant Legal Resources Center in San Francisco. He serves on the National Advisory Council of the Asian American Justice Center in Washington, D.C. Please welcome Professor Heen. Thanks, Tom. And thanks for, to all of you for showing interest, enough interest to show up tonight. Uh, it's a beautiful night outside, and I'm sure, well, there are no sports to compete, right? <laughs> uh, so, Tom actually has given me uh, a pretty straightforward assignment. I'm going to try to do it in a TED Talk length <laughs> amount of time of under 20 minutes. Uh, and he wants me to, make a, to basically make a connection with what happened historically to Asian American communities um, and, and what's happening today. Uh, and so, as you can see from the outline, and I know it's hard to see for people in the back, uh, but I am going to make some assumptions that, uh, that some of you may or may not catch on to, but uh, the United States is a nation of immigrants, but it has always been a nation that loves to debate immigration policy. From the very beginning, from the be very beginning, you had, uh, you had such people as John Adams versus George Washington. 
George Washington was welcome everyone to the bosom of America. John Adams was we got we got to worry about uh, terrorists coming from France uh, and the and Benjamin Franklin. We don't want any of these German speakers coming to the United States. So you have Benjamin Franklin and John Adams on one side and George Washington on the other. And so that kind of debate has always gone on. And it's important to keep in mind that that, that has always been part of the US history. Depending on who's in control of Congress, that's when you have anti-immigrant policies or whether or not you have uh, open immigration policies. And so it ebbs and flows, and we're at the worst era that I've ever seen, and I've been practicing immigration law since 1974. Uh, and uh, I, I, I've gone through a lot of crap uh, in terms of enforcement. It's never been as bad. It's never been as bad as today. So uh, on the West Coast, the anti-Chinese rhetoric uh, led to the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882 that was eventually became permanent uh, uh, several years later. And that's when, uh, in the immigration laws, we began to see embody the notion of who is an American? Who is a real American? And it was very clear that Chinese were never gonna be real Americans. They looked different, they ate different, they spoke different. Um, and so race and social antipathy toward Chinese led to the Chinese Exclusion Act. And it wasn't that many years later, after Japanese started coming in larger numbers, that there was antipathy towards Japanese migrants who first went to Hawaii and then came to the West Coast. And the same kind of anti-Japanese sentiment uh, came about. But instead of passing a Chinese Exclusion Act, the United States was, uh, instead of passing a Japanese Exclusion Act, the United States was afraid of doing that. Why? Because the Japanese had won the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. So the United States didn't want to engage Japan in that manner. So instead they negotiated. Secretary of State of the United States went to Japan and negotiated this thing that's now called the Gentlemen's Agreement. And under the agreement, there would no longer be any laborers that could come to the United States from Japan. But those laborers that were here, they could bring spouses and they could engage in, in picture bride practice. So that was a big difference between the Japanese and the Chinese. The Chinese were cut off, it was mostly men, so the, Jap the Chinese population steadily declined after 1882. The Japanese population steadily increased because even after 1907, because families were allowed to form. And so up until 1970, the largest subgroup of Asian Americans in the United States were Japanese because of the fact that they could grow. Uh, but, and this isn't on the, on the chart here, but in California, there was such continuing to be anti-Japanese sentiment, uh, particularly because of ownership of property in the, in the agricultural areas, the, the California leg legislator passed something called the, the Alien Land Laws. And it was directed actually at two groups that were beginning to make money from agricultural land. And th those were Japanese and South Asians. Uh, so there was a fomenting a South Asian and anti-South Asian sentiment as well in the early 1910s. And that's what was embodied in the Asiatic Bard Zone. We, the United States actually passed a law that said nobody from this part of the world could immigrate. And it drew a line all around the Asian countries. The only exception were Japanese because of the gentlemen's agreement. So Japanese could still bring their wives, but they couldn't, there couldn't be new labor migration. But that all ended. There, were, there continued to be anti-Japanese sentiment. And this is important as a lead up to, to internment. Uh, there continued to be anti-Japanese sentiment throughout the ninth, early 1920s. And in 1924, what most immigration historians talk about is something called the National Origins Quota System, which emphasized the uh, Western European uh, dominance of immigration. 
national origins quota favored people from Western Europe. Um, and, and slipped into the 1924 national origins law was a provision that said, if you're not eligible for citizenship through naturalization, if you're not eligible for citizenship through naturalization, you cannot immigrate. They didn't mention one word that was racial. But in fact, no Asians were eligible for naturalization. Even though you were lawfully here, you could not apply to be naturalized if you were Asians. There were, the, the, the United States Constitution said the only people eligible for, for naturalization were free white people. Free white people. And it wasn't until the end of the Civil War that that was amended to include free slaves. Okay? But it didn't mention anything about other people of color so that no one else could get naturalized. And so by having a provision in the 1924 Act that uh, no one eligible for naturalization could immigrate, that's closed the door on, Jap on any Japanese migration to the United States, including spouses. But um, so war changes things in, in many respects. And uh, all those of you in this room are all too familiar was internment, um, and you all know what brought that about, as crazy it was, but some of you may not know that the federal government, when, when the Korematsu and Hirabayashi case were argued at the Supreme Court in the 1940s, some of you may not know that the federal government lied to the United States Supreme Court. Their brief, the Supreme Court brief by the federal government said that they had surveillance evidence that Japanese Americans posed a national security threat. That was all made up. Yeah. The, uh, and as many of you know, there's a book by Peter Irons where he discovered the old, the first version of the brief that said, we don't have any evidence. And then the different iterations of it that were just made up that said that they had evidence and, and they didn't have any evidence. And that all came to light when Fred Korematsu did his uh, writ of error quorum nobis in the 1980s, 40 years after his conviction by the Supreme Court was upheld, that Judge Marilyn Patel in San Francisco ruled that in fact uh, there was a lie and that Fred Korematsu's conviction could be set aside 40 years later. Uh, but, um, but the war uh, did lead to a cracking open of the exclusion laws uh, to Japanese, to South Asians, and a little bit to Filipinos, but I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, in, in the sense that there was a lot of propaganda that the Japan, the, the Japan was, uh, was engaging in. They said to China, how can you be an ally of the United States when in fact the United States isn't even allowing you Chinese to immigrate to the country? And so that led to the Chinese repealer in 1943 so that the Chinese Exclusion Act, because of the war, was repealed in 1943, and a big, gigantic quota was provided for Chinese immigrants of 105 per year. That was a Chinese quota, beginning in 1943. Uh, that all, all the while, Filipinos posed a, a, a different challenge to the United States, because, as many of you may know, in 1898, another war, the United States defeated Spain in 1898 in the Spanish-American War. What the hell does that have to do with the Philippines? Well, the Philippines were owned by Spain. And part of the spoils of the war was that the United States got the Philippines in 1898. And, they became, and so overnight, Filipinos became non-citizen nationals of the United States. They weren't aliens anymore. But, and they weren't citizens, but they were nationals of the United States. Kind of a weird in between ground. But because they were not aliens, the immigration laws didn't apply to them. So Filipinos began coming at, in large numbers. Um, and that upset mostly Californians. Filipinos were, they made us uncomfortable. Uh, they, they could speak English. Uh, there's all this literature on how they went to dance halls and danced with white women. And white men didn't like that kind of thing. And so there was a backlash against Filipinos. And, uh, but you couldn't do anything about it because they were not aliens. You couldn't do an immigration law. So strange bedfellows. There were nationalists in the Philippines who wanted their own independence, and there were anti-Filipinos in the United States.
together in 1934 and passed the Philippine Independence Act of 1934, announcing that 12 years later, the Philippines would be their own independent country on July 4th, <laughs> 1946, okay? And so, once that happened, overnight in 1946, Filipinos became aliens, and they could then be excluded from the United States. Um, okay, so, Fast forward, 1952, there's a major overhaul of the immigration laws, but Harry Truman actually said, we actually got to do something. Uh, Harry, Harry Truman's infamous in this room for other reasons, but, um, but in terms of immigration, he felt that we shouldn't use a national origins quota system, so he actually vetoed the 1952 act, but, it was, but his veto was overridden. Uh, but finally, when, uh, when John Kennedy was elected president in 1960, he had, he had written a book called The Nation of Immigrants, in which he won a Pulitzer Prize as a U.S. Senator, in which he argued that the, that the national origins quota systems were ashamed, that we ought to be ashamed of favoring people only from Western Europe. So he wanted a first come, first serve system. You just apply and you set a number and whoever's in line first, they get to come in. That isn't what happened. After he was assassinated and Lyndon Johnson did push through immigration reform, we got kind of the framework of what we have today, which is a per country numerical limitation. And that, that became very problematic, especially for Mexicans in 1965. Prior to 1965, there actually was not a quota for Mexicans for anyone in the Western Hemisphere, this part of the country. But overnight, in 1965, all of a sudden there was a quota of 120,000 for all of the Americas, Canada, Mexico, Central America, and Latin America. They were limited to 120,000 visas. Never before had there been a limitation until 1965 for people from Latin America. And immediately, Mexico became, began to dominate that 120,000 visas. Each year, Mexico, Mexicans used about 50,000, at least, of the 120,000 visas, because that 120,000 was a first-come, first-served system. The rest of the world, outside of the Western Hemisphere, each country got visas of 20,000, okay? And so Mexico was getting 50,000 under the newly imposed Western Hemisphere quota. 1976, that came to a screeching halt. In 1976, somebody said, well, why should Mexicans get 50,000 visas? Everybody should have the same as the rest of the world. So in 1976, a new visa system was imposed, and Mexicans were also then limited to 20,000 visas per year. So Mexico goes from unlimited to 100, part of 120,000 to 20,000 in 1976. And I lived through all that because I was practicing by then. And I knew that people were, were part, the backlog was growing and growing. Uh, in the, 19, the 1980s is, is relevant to what's happening right now because in, in, in the 1980s there were serious civil war in Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala, and large numbers of folks started coming to the United States, fleeing that violence. Uh, but they, they didn't fit into our definition of what asylum uh, refugees should be. And so we rejected those applications at a rate of over 90% for Guatemala, actually over 95% were Donai, for Guatemalans and El Salvadorans. Uh, Nicaraguans were granted at a higher rate, at about 25%, because Nicaragua, uh, the government of Nicaragua was an enemy, and continues to be an enemy of the United States. And if you don't think that political asylum uh, isn't based on politics, you're wrong. Uh, judgments are made all the time on who's our friend and who's not our friend in terms of, uh, of asylum and refugees. Uh, IRCA in 1986 was, the, was an, uh, an amnesty for undocumented immigrants. It was very narrow, and about three million people got green card status, lawful residents, under Immigration Reform and Control Act. The vast majority were Mexicans, but for most of them, they had to live here for five years. And so overnight, even though there was Amnesty for three million. Overnight, there continued to be an undocumented population. Uh, in in 1996, 
President Clinton was still the president, but the, both houses of Congress were dominated by Republicans. And so they negotiated and passed immigration reform that has, it's just wreaked havoc on immigration practice today. One of the things that was part of the 1996 laws is the institution of something called the, the three or 10 year bar. Uh, prior to 1996, if you're undocumented uh, and you leave the country, for example, to process a visa, as long as you process your visa, you get to come right back, okay? After 1996, if you've been undocumented in the country for more than a year, if you've been undocumented in the country for more than a year, and you leave, you cannot come back for 10 years. And so that's a very harsh result. And also, 1996 had a terrorism provision in it. This before September 11, 2001. And this was a result, ironically, of the Oklahoma City bombings, which had nothing to do with immigrants. Oklahoma City bombings were conducted by white supremacists. But yet, when that happened, they fir people first thought it was terrorists from abroad, but it was wrong. But that sentiment carried over to an anti-terrorism provision in 1996, which, which blossomed, unfortunately, uh, or grew. Uh, blossom is too nice of a word. After September 11th, uh, and, and my, my colleague here from CARE, is gonna, I'm sure, is going to talk more about that. But, uh, you know, but when we... Uh, uh, when we talk about the, the travel ban and the, the, the Muslim ban uh, that Donald Trump has engaged in, and, uh, it was argued at Supreme Court uh, a few weeks ago, and the decision on whether or not to uphold version three of the travel ban is about to come out sometime this month. And unfortunately, I, I, I predict, I hope I'm wrong, that the Supreme Court's going to uphold the travel ban. That, that travel, and, and in spite of the fact that, for example, Karen Korematsu, and Gordon here, Bayashi's daughter, they saw the connection between the Muslim ban and what happened to Japanese Americans. Um, uh, but I, 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 I don't want to get uh, let President Obama off the hook. Uh, he deserves credit for DACA. He deserves credit for a few things that he attempted. He prosecutorial discretion. Some people that keep their nose clean. He allowed to stay in the country. But he, he, he was actually named the deporter-in-chief mm -hmm. by many of us uh, yeah. because he deported more people in his term than George Bush um, and Bill Clinton combined. Uh, and the worst thing that I think he did was as a result of 2014, the summer of 2014, you may recall, that large numbers of unaccompanied children came from Central America for different reasons from the 1980s. 1980s, it was civil strife. Now, in 2014, it's gang violence, it's cartel violence, and in many cases, domestic violence. Uh, and, uh, and prior to that summer, what happened generally when people came in those conditions was what the press is called catch and release. Uh, people would be written up, and they would be told, where are you going? Okay, you're going to Chicago. Well, you've got to go to the immigration hearing in Chicago. And they, they wrote you up. And, Way over 99% of people showed up. There was no abscontion. There was no abscontion. But in reaction to the cr criticism that the Republicans lodged on him, they, they blamed Obama for attracting these unaccompanied kids for the most insane reason. They said, well, it's because you, you, you did this DACA thing. Uh, the young kids think that they can come here and get DACA, which, of course, is crazy. That isn't why they're coming. So he, he elected to open detention centers. Because at the same time, uh, there were women that were also coming with their children. And so there's two gigantic family detention centers that Obama opened in Carnes, Texas and Dilly, Texas that house about 1,500 people each. And I've been there on inspections. Imagine a room this size, and I'll tell you that that's a log of it. Uh, I have a two and a half year old granddaughter. Imagine a room this size with adults that look like you that have your two to six year old sitting on your lap. They've just been arrested, and they're detained in these facilities. And people are crying, people are lethargic, people are sick. Uh, and Obama started that, and, and President Trump has doubled down on it. So uh, to me, that's his big, Obama's biggest shame. So I, 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 I'm, the main message that I would give to you is that um, 
uh, I still believe that this is about a battle over who is an American. Uh, that, that there are people who are leaders of this country that continue to think that America is Western European. Maybe a little bit broader European, Norway, right? <laughs> but that, that's the vision. So that, so that even though you're a citizen, even though you're a citizen, it, you're still an other. Uh, and that goes for people with immigrant backgrounds, that goes for blacks in the United States, it goes for Asians, it goes for South Asians. It, 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 there are people that just are engaging in this othering and they're trying to fit it into immigration policy. And, uh, and, and Mr. Trump, and we'll talk about this more, you know, he's used the things that we've seen in the historic, we've seen the tension, we've seen racial stuff, we've seen uh, uh, in, engaging in criminalization of the communities, uh, and, uh, and it, it's, unfortunately, it's nothing new. It's, it's a repeat of what's happened historically, but it's so, so concentrated now that uh, he, he's, uh, I, I picture this devious, man with other devious men <laughs> sitting around a table conjuring up what can we do next because it's 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 never a dull moment with this uh, administration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for that very condensed and <laughs> history of immigration. I went longer than 20 minutes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I think it was very informative. We're going to have a panel uh, presentation discussion next, and if I can get some help moving the, the chairs up while that's happening. Uh, of course, on our panel is Bill, who you already met. Um, just sitting down now is Ahmad Rafiki. He's from the Council on American Islamic Relations and Care. He's the Civil Rights and Legal Services Coordinator. He represents the San Francisco Bay Area Chapter of CARE, which is one of the oldest chapters in the country. CARE was created to work to uphold civil rights of American Muslims, foster better understanding of Islamic faith and its followers, and help find avenues for Muslims to integrate more fully into the broader society. And this organization provides legal services and educational outreach and conducts out advocacy work. Next, we have Teresa Castellanos. Teresa is a well-known immigrant rights activist in our community, one extremely dedicated to her work and extremely knowledgeable about it as well. Teresa is very active as a leader in our local educational system as well. She serves as a trustee of the San Jose Unified School District Board and for the Metro Ed or Metropolitan Education District. So um, to start us off, if Ahmad, uh, you would like to uh, make an opening statement and maybe in response to what Professor Hing has said in the video you, you just saw. Y'all can hear me? Yes. Okay. yes. Well, thank you again to the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. Um, I had the pleasure of being here last month, uh, speaking about the Mexican Repatriation Act. Um, and, and so, um, this is a learning experience for me, and I want to, I guess, uh, if anything, add uh, uh, very little to what Professor Hingis said. He's an expert in this area. And so, um, I guess the view that our organization takes and uh, I've learned to take is um, to see this country as a nation of immigrants, but also not to forget that that is not the beginning of this country. Uh, this country did not start with immigration, it started with colonization. Um, it was not uh, immigrants who came and landed in uh, this country, it was uh, predominantly um, uh, white Europeans seeking a land that, uh, and this land that we stand on, Mahogany land, um, and so it's not very, very uh, strange that we are here in a country which remains the world's only empire uh, as, of, as of today, um, that we see the exclusion of black and brown um, and, and, and uh, Muslim faces um, in this space. Um, a lot of what Professor Hing said about anti-Japanese and anti-Chinese sentiment resonates. Um, this idea that um, our immigration policy is not fair, not, not based on actual true national security. That, for example, individuals from countries that are uh, Middle Eastern and predominantly Muslim still tend to be allowed in countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, the UAE. Not that I'm advocating that individuals from those countries should be stopped, but you know that 
with the strong uh, political and economic ties that the Trump family and uh, the elites of our country do, and, and you see that they are not scapegoated, but it's, it's other individuals. This idea that um, you only allow, for example, people who are already in there and to be separated from their family. We're seeing this with the end of the diversity visa lottery. We're seeing this with the end of uh, quotas for derivative visas to bring spouses here and children, and we've seen that devastating impact on uh, our clients' family members. Um, we're seeing this in the lies that the Trump administration has spoken about proof of national security threat. It's the same as the accusations made against Japanese Americans. Uh, like Professor Haney said, that you can never truly be American. To be American, you would have to be not Muslim. That a Muslim couldn't be loyal to their nation and to their faith. That being Muslim is inherently opposed to being American. The same way that, for example, the accusations were leveled against Japanese Americans, that they could only be true to the empire and to their religion. Um, and so, uh, for me, as, as someone who's significantly less, less experienced than my panelists, and to hear from them um, is a reminder for, for those of us who are younger that we've seen this before, that we stand in solidarity with each other, and we will outlive this, uh, this realm of bigotry and hatred. But it, it, it comes with a sober reminder that this, is always, this has always been the way this country has been. Um, and this is not to say that you don't love the country, but it's also a, a sober reminder. Um, I'm sorry if I went too long. I would start off with, I do agree that the core of the discussion is who is an American. That's what we're debating. And I think as a state, we have a lot of experience in that debate because we had this debate 22 years ago. And when we passed 187, um, there was two additional elections that communities of color lost, which was affirmative action and by the education. But after the passage of 187, we changed 150 years of California history because what Bill talked about here originated in California. The Chinese Exclusion Act originated in California and all the anti-Asian laws originated in California. So after 187, we begin changing California history and now we're a state where we pass 12 to 15 immigrant only laws that are meant to protect the immigrant community that aren't affecting US citizens anymore. So after 187, we did change 150 years of California history. Um, I think, yes, we're ahead, 22 years ahead of the demographic shift, but we have to continue to do our work. And we're still part of the United States. So we're bombarded by this anti-immigrant media. And so it doesn't mean that we don't have anti-immigrant sentiments in California. I mean, as we've been seeing with the sanctuary laws, uh, people go and people joining the Trump, uh, the Trump lawsuit against California. We have a lot of work to do, but at the same time, we are ahead. We've been living in diversity for 22 years. We we know. What, and especially Santa Clara County in particular, we aren't segregated by race. We're segregated by class, without a doubt. But we live in diverse communities, whereas other immigrant communities, you, you can go to the Chinese part of town. You can go to the Mexican part of town. And yeah, those are, there's a little bit of similarity, but you're doing it more by class, not by, not by uh, ethnicity or race. And I think what that gives us is an opportunity for coalition building and for working together. And that is what California has been doing for the last 22 years, is we've been building coalitions across ethnicity, across immigration status, um, across a diversity of ways. And so I think we're ahead as a state. We have a lot of work to do. I think number one, we should be, we should be teaching ethnic studies as a graduation requirement for both high school and uh, college. Because the 21st century means understanding other parts of the world. We live in a global economy. We can't get out of that global economy anymore. And the only way we're going to succeed is by understanding each other. And I think what, what this presentation brings to mind is we are more alike than we are different same things over and over again and we're coming to a time period where it's going to get scarier before it gets better so what are those alliances that we're building and what are those movements that we're creating because we really do have to be the resistance
we're, we're going to open it up to some questions in the audience. Does anybody have would like to make the first question? Uh, okay, do you mind if I ask the oh, yeah, panel? Yeah, I, I'd like to know what their day-to-day, week-to-week work is uh, in their programs. Thanks, Bill. Um, I'd also take this opportunity to recognize um, my law clerk and a former student of yours, Shreya. Uh, if you can stand up, sorry, I know I'm, I'm embarrassing you. Um, so she's, this is her first time to the museum, and this is her first week of the job, so she can kind of cooperate in the work that we do. Um, and she's, she's got the, you know, she's got, she's learned from Bill. Um, our day to day, um, Bill mentioned uh, that the Supreme Court decision is, is going to come out anytime. So we're expecting it to come out anytime now. Like, the, the, the official date is, say, June 25th, but it could come out anytime soon. Now. Um, and to be fair, from our end, we don't expect it to be a positive decision, uh, simply because this country does have a history of the Supreme Court letting us down. That's the Korematsu decision. That's the, that's the Dred Scott decision. That's that the slavery was legal, um, and that uh, African Americans were not uh, quite human enough to be con considered as citizens. Um, our day-to-day -day is dealing with community members who tell us that their family members uh, are stuck overseas, um, seeking medical treatment. Our families separated from their mothers and their siblings. Um, our day-to-day -day is hearing of hate crimes and constant reminders. I think one of the things that, was, that I mentioned last time was seeing how simple symbols of uh, the Islamic faith being denigrated. Uh, you know, seeing, uh, seeing um, sort of that symbol of faith seen as opposite to American values. Uh, the arson is something that sticks with me. Every day we hear, not necessarily in California, but all across the country, a mosque, a community center that is spray painted by graffiti. Uh, the, the funny thing for me is that racists continue to use things like wine, alcohol, and pork as if it will be offensive, but really is not that original. It gets old the first five hundred times. It really does get old. Um, and you think they learn, but I mean, they are an uncreative bunch after all. Uh, but it's, it's things like that. It's hearing from uh, community members who, for example, and, and especially, we know this, and, and as men, we're privileged, we don't have the experience that women of color, and Muslim women of color are always at the forefront of any bigotry. Their hijabs are pulled. Those of them who don't wear the hijab are, are targeted for as backward or seen as oppressive. And the biggest label that Muslim women get is as submissive. Um, and any Muslim woman in my family will tell you that's not the case. Uh, I am raised by Muslim women, by women of color, who have, uh, who have more power and more dignity than, uh, than a nation could uh, muster. Um, so our day-to-day -day looks like that. It's telling family members that we don't have an update for you. We just got to sit tight. But knowing that regardless of what uh, decision comes through, we will stand. Um, my, my sister here mentioned solidarity. Uh, we have not forgotten that uh, Hillary Clinton was the one who said that the reason we need to send unaccompanied minors back is to not give their parents any idea that we will support them. That is not the kind of leadership we need. That is not the kind of opposition that we need. We don't need Clinton light. Uh, and so the idea is when we do go ahead and build these coalitions, and a lot of our work is, and the idea is building coalitions, is seeing that we have a lot of members in our community who are citizens, but a lot of them are also immigrants. Um, the separation of families that we see ICE conduct, uh, we are engaged in ensuring that, to be honest, there will be no reform of ICE. There, the only hope is demolition, uh, or, the, or the, uh, the abolition of ICE, for example. You can have other enforcement agencies for immigration laws, but not ICE, not, 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 not uh, agencies that are built on uh, tearing families apart using weapons. Uh, against helpless communities, and so our day-to-day -day life isn't very uh, isn't a very happy affair. But the thing that we have, and that, that oftentimes white supremacists, ethno-nationalists, and most especially um, those in the moneyed elite, and the capitalist class, don't have is community. Uh, we have uh, the the gift of events like this, speaking together and sitting together, without any hatred for anyone, um, and just the understanding to, to speak. So we bless them. So in my day to day, I work for local government and I, and I am a school board member. Um, part of the work that we do is community education, know your rights. Um, we also fund local legal service providers um, to provide services for reduced prices or almost free. Um, I would say that my day to day is when I first went did presentations right after DACA, um, maybe I went to seven high schools. Uh, when Trump got elected, I might have gone to 27 schools in a year. 
This fiscal year, we've gone to 57 schools. And if you add the community presentations on top of that, we've gone to 127 schools. And we're a staff of, of two. <laughs> um, but the need is that great. The fear is that great. I have adults that cry for an hour and a half straight. And they're crying and crying and crying. And in the beginning, I felt really bad about this. But at the same time, they're there with people in the same situation. At the same time, they're getting relief. And at the same time, they're getting information. Um, I know that there are second and third generation Latino children who think they're going to get separated from their parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, certain yeah, children who are US citizens. And so if this is not going to affect their generation, but it's such a big conversation in schools that second and third generation children think they're going to get separated mm -hmm. from their parents. Um, I would also say that as local government, we've seen people refuse their food boxes because they think they're going to get on the list. Yeah. We've seen people get off WIC because they think they're going to get on the list. We've seen people say, after presentation, should I get off my food stamps? Because they're afraid they're going to get on the list. And so he is using fear to govern. Mm -hmm. And he is being so incredibly effective in that governing. And I would say that ethnic media used to play a role of education. They are now playing a role of fear. Mm -hmm. And I would say, especially in the Latino community, they are only promoting fear. Um, I know that there's local producers who have told their staff, your job is to make sure people don't sleep. And I would say that's across all languages that that is taking place. I don't think it's just Latino media. But, la but I have relationship with the Latino media where they've told me that they're being told that's their job. And so we also have to pay attention, how are we, how are we reproducing fear? Fear is contagious. Fear is so incredibly contagious. Uh, about two weeks, about a month ago, my daughter wakes me up on a Saturday and says, uh, Mom, immigration is on Story and King, because her girlfriend called her. What do we do? What do we do? And I said, call, what do you want me to do? Call the Rapid Response Network. And they'll send legal observers and they'll figure out what it was. And so it ended up that it was uh, some kind of drug raid, but everyone was terrified. She goes out to eat uh, lunch later with her girlfriend. Um, they're at a, re a Mexican restaurant. Uh, two police officers walk in. The waitress gets terrified. Her best friend gets terrified. Everyone in the restaurant is terrified. And she's like, Mom, I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. And she says, and then I remember, I'm a US citizen. <laughs> but, but fear is contagious. When, it, when it's spreading, it is contagious. And so she said, I remembered I'm a US citizen. And I got up and I asked the police officers, what are you doing here? And they said, we're here for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the depth of fear that, that people are carrying. And this is not like PTSD, where there's an incident and you get triggered. This is constant fear and, and that constant stress of how do we deal with this in a community. And so I think important to all of this is our community building. That is what's going to help us survive. Together, we're going to survive as communities. And I think this bridge building is key. Because I don't think this happens in a whole lot of areas where we are talking about what are the similar things that we are facing. And, and the only way we're going to survive this is together in solidarity. Does anybody have a question? Um, is there a microphone? Um, I'm, my name is Susan. Um, I, my question is, uh, you know, Japanese Americans have spent um, decades doing public education about the World War II experience of Japanese Americans. And I guess I'd like to ask the panelists, um, how can a Japanese American history both in the camps and also in the redress movement, um, how can that help what's happening right now? I see a lot of leadership coming from the Japanese American community, even connecting with the Muslim community and connecting with the Latino community. I think the most important thing is to talk about what has taken place. Because if we don't know our history, we don't realize when it's being repeated. And right now, it's being repeated. And I have been going to the, to the remembrance events probably for about 15 years. And it was this year that it, it sunk in my head. It said Japanese ancestry 
it wasn't Japanese immigrants. It was U.S. citizens of Japanese ancestry. And so, and in the discussion that we had here a month ago, 70% of the, of the Mexicans deported were U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. So this is not going to stop at immigrants. This is going to continue. And so we need to make sure that we are stepping up in every opportunity possible. And I do see the Japanese community taking on a leadership because of a pain that took place. And so I applaud you for that. And, and this interactive conversation, I haven't seen it take place anywhere else. And part of it is we're so overwhelmed as communities that we need someone else to come and say, hey, let's, make, let's connect these dots. Because I think connecting the dots is key. Yeah, I, I would just add, repeating myself, uh, and not as eloquently as that essay, but I think it's very important for, for you to talk to your neighbors and your children uh, about the connections because there really are striking similarities between uh, the efforts to exclude a whole race, a whole religion, uh, and and the use of detention mm -hmm. is so striking. I mean, uh, there's as crazy as this may sound. There's actually a law that says that the United States ICE immigrants they're supposed to at least have thirty-five thousand people in detention every day. It's a man. It's a ma It's a mandatory bed number. No other area of law you, it's required that you have at least 35,000 people in custody. And they actually meet it pretty easily, to be honest with you. But, um, uh, but again, I, again, what little I know about internment, because I was not there, and I'm not Japanese-American, um, uh, but I do know some, some things. There, were, there was community uh, in some respects, and you can correct me. Uh, but the, the current detention centers, they don't get a chance to have any community. It, it's like there's constant court monitoring of how awful the, condi the conditions are. And so it, it's quite a contrast. And I would again push, I think this is why ethnic studies is important and advocating for ethnic studies. Because if we don't know our history, we can't connect the dots, and it's on purpose that we don't know our history. And when the, and across all three, I just wanted to say something about uh, it's important for us to remember that each one of us is a teacher. And you mentioned to talk to our children and etc. that we must know our, our history, and I wanted to share something with you. Um, I've been teaching Mexican folk dance in this community, Teresa knows me because I taught her daughters as well, for 47 years now. And there's a lot of things that have happened to that that have a universal string. And she knows that I talk to the children a lot. And I have a soft, calm voice, and the parents listen to me and they, uh, because I take them to things where they learn about their rights and that kind of stuff. I have a lot of people who are mixed status. And one of the, one of the things that happened that, that made me very emotional was um, a year ago. Um, so we had a new president and all this. And um, the parents who were undocumented or in families of mixed status, I'm having a folk dance class at Garden Community Center, and the kids are all dancing, and there are parents that are literally weeping and trying for their children not to see that. They're hysterically crying. They're watching their beautiful children dance. And, and I went up and I said, are you okay? You know, like this, in this one particular case? And she said in Spanish to me, she said, I would die if they took me away from my children. I would just die. And, that, and it was so much hysteria from the kids and the parents that even when we were going to go to a folk dance conference in Fresno this March, we're still talking about that. Should we go? Because you know in Fresno this was happening with the 7-Elevens and this, that, and if we drive, and, you know, and I got the ones that didn't have driver's licenses, I helped them get them, so they rely on me to keep, to keep them informed. So I always act very calm. And I, and I try to give them the best that I can. But with the children, they're all sitting there. And this is Ramadan right now. The kids know it. And something that happened that made me, when we were taking a break and I'm talking to them, and I said, so do you guys know what Ramadan is? And they're from ages 6 through 12, 12, 12 13. And the parents were out there. And uh, the first thing that happened was 
The one child in my group whose parents have a lot of money, who was blonde and blue-eyed, they happen to own a lot of businesses, said, Ramadan, Bamadan, yeah, and he laughed and he thought he would, everybody would laugh at him. He thought he was saying something that would make him be big, you know? And the other kids kind of went, huh, huh, what, huh, to him. And I didn't react. And I said, well, you know, we just had Lent. Got a lot of Catholics here. I said, Lent is 40 days long. What do we do in Lent? You guys know what we do in Lent. I'm not Catholic, but you know, since so many of them are, I know about Lent, okay. And I said, we try to become a better person. We think about how we can help our community. We bring our families together. We don't eat meat on Fridays. We have a special diet. We do that. I said, that's the same thing for the Muslims. Ramadan is their Lent. They do it for about a month. It's, it's the very same thing. They try to be a better person. They bring their families together. They have a special diet. Da, da, da. I said, so how would you feel if someone made a, a joke like Ramadan, Ramadan, about Lent? And it just kept it real simple. We're just talking like that. Um, but it's a, still a very emotional thing between the parents to travel or to go any place. And so we all have an opportunity simple moments to be a teacher and to, to help in that regard. And those kids have been changed because of that. They've been changed now. Thank you for letting me say that. Uh, one more question, please. Right here. So uh, I, I think um, it's, it's a humongous problem that we are taught lies in school. Anybody who goes to school in this country, we are taught humongous lies all throughout our education, elementary school, middle school, high school, and university. And the only people who know the truth are people who search out the truth or their parents tell them the truth. <clears throat> and, and so it's super important um, for people like myself who are um, on Eastern European descent um, also know the truth. And I think we need to be very creative about how to get the truth out there because mainstream media is definitely not news. Uh, it's more brainwashing and pushing the hate out there. So I think we need to be very creative about how to get the truth out there. And, um, which is difficult because so many people are working so hard they just don't have the time to search out the truth. But I really would think it's, it would be a good idea to get together, brainstorm about how to do that. Um, I know it's each one teach one, but there are way too many um, European descent people who live in this country who are totally oblivious and blind um, to the truth. And some of them want to stay ignorant um, and we, we, have to, we have to end that. We really have to, because if everybody knows the truth about the history, then it's clear about who's, who's the real enemy and who isn't. Thank you. And we um, have a couple more parts to our program, and I've been reminded that we actually want people to talk more at our reception, so we're going to. No, 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 it's not your fault. Um, so that's what we're going to do. But um, what I'd like to have is if there are any other um, things that you the panelists would like to say, or if there's any other announcements out here before we move on. Did you, Susan? Thank you. I just have a quick announcement. Um, so I think, um, you know, our, our heads have been touched by all the information that we're getting, and I think our hearts have been touched by um, some of the stories we've heard. But I think it's also time for our feet and for our mouths to get involved. So uh, I, there's going to be a, a rally at City Hall on the 14th next Thursday to protest the family separations. And, and also, as the panelists have said, that there's going to be uh, probably something happening when the Supreme Court uh, announces their decision on the Muslim ban. And so I have a sign-up sheet. So please, at the reception, come see me if you want to start doing something together. My sign-up sheet is Japanese Americans and Friends. We all commit to, I'm inviting 10 people. Are 10 people going to show up? I don't know, but I'm going to invite 10. And if I'm lucky, three to five show up. And, and, and I'm going to say that I think it's going to get harder before it's going to get easier. 
So we're going to have a lot of opportunities to invite each other to stand together. And I think that's the most important thing we can do. Yeah, I, uh, one thing I'd like to add is to, I, I, I believe that most of you are here out of interest, obviously. Um, the three of us are probably very like-minded, uh, but some of you may not be, uh, or some of you may still be wondering. Uh, and this is what I would ask you to do. Those of you who are wondering about our positions, and is there, is there enough room here for any, all the immigrants that want to come in, what about all, all the undocumented folks? Uh, get to know people. Uh, find out, ask who they are and why they're here. Find out about those families that have come to the border and are presenting. Don't just read the commodification of them, that there's X number that are, find out, read this, the media that does exist, it explains why they, why they trekked all the way through Mexico mm -hmm. to, and other countries to get here. So at least do that for yourself. Become educated about why people are, are coming. It's not for an adventure, I'll tell you that, okay? Uh, and, um, and, and then if you decide that you're still not with us, okay. But, but at least be honest with yourself and find out as much as you can about the people who these policies are affecting and, and who they are and what their values are. And I, I don't think I have anything significant to add to one of the wonderful things that have been said, um, uh, except to say that um, to your point, and also to all of the point, uh, to all of uh, various other points about education and, and then showing up, um, is that we have to realize, um, you know, while there seems to be a lot of racial animosity in the history of this country, uh, one uniting factor for all Americans is, as I said, class. Um, the wages of whiteness um, are not real. They're real to an extent, and so I, I recommend people to read The Wages of Whiteness by W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the most uh, preeminent uh, socialist and intellectual uh, Americans of all time about how uh, the wages of whiteness are sold to the vast, vast majority of white Americans who actually do not benefit all that much from it. Uh, just to be a small rung above people of color. Um, to this idea that any solution to our existing woes, our anti-immigrant rhetoric, will be solutions based on better economic policy. We'll be putting ordinary working class uh, and poor Americans at the forefront. And to realize that we, the vast majority of working class and poor Americans, uh, are united, uh, and, and, and I know that the, working, the white working class has been put, uh, thrown under the bus, but it is not the white working class that is that has thrown us in there. Um, it's this realization that we are at a time when 30 years from now, we will, we will either be able to say that we stood up for the civil rights fight of our generation, or we'll be able to say that we just did by, and that's the argument that many conservatives make, is that this is not like the civil rights struggle that Dr. Martin Luther King did, or this is not like that example, but it is exactly like that. Um, as, the, as the famous uh, saying of a German Catholic priest was, at first they came for the socialists, and now you didn't say something. And they came for the trade unionists. Um, I guess I finally end this with saying, also remembering the history of this country with Jewish Americans, and the exclusion of Jewish Americans who were uh, running away from the Holocaust and us turning them back. Um, is there is a reminder to us that at various stages, uh, we will always be questioned about how far we're willing to exclude, to extend the label of human to our fellow man uh, and woman. And, and at this point, we find that uh, immigrants and Muslim Americans and, and Muslims in general are not uh, sort of given that advantage. And I, and I guess want to thank you for, for being here to listen uh, to us today. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, so we started this program talking about stories and the fact that even though we come from very different communities with different backgrounds, we think that this is a way to help people connect. And in the reception, we'd like you to keep this discussion going. Um, there is something we'd like to end with, though, and it's connected to the thing that maybe you're still sitting on, a little boldly. Uh, we want to inspire you to think about what to write on that. And to do this, we're going to share a few stories. Um, and um, if you could uh, please uh, somebody pass the mic to Susan to get started here. 
I just wanted to say that these short stories are dramatic readings uh, to help us understand the impact of exclusionary policy. The Chinese were excluded. Japanese Americans were incarcerated en masse. Mexican Americans were deported. Muslims are being excluded. So let's listen and, and reflect. Okay. This is my grandmother's story. My name is Ng Tong Shi. The Chinese Exclusion Act made our lives very difficult. When my family wanted to visit relatives, we needed to apply for identity cards to prove that we were in California before we left for Hawaii or China. When we returned to the United States, we were interrogated on Angel Island, even though we had identity cards and even though we were American citizens. I was born in California in, 19, in 1869 in Lone Pine. My children were born in Gilroy, San Francisco. Yet, we even needed to get a white person to recognize us and to swear that we were the same individuals that had left the country and are now returning. This is Jiro Saito's story. What was Mama thinking during those days in the horse stalls at Santa Anita? Her husband was arrested, she had lost her home, and now had to put up with a crying boy who wanted to go home to O.K. Yotan said that she was peeling a red radish in our living quarters when we received a stack of telegrams from New Mexico. The telegram on top told about my father's death in the Lordsburg camp. His heart had given out. My mother saw the stunned expression on Yotan's face, and she asked her what had happened. Yotan said to tell Mama that Papa had died was one of the hardest things she ever had to do. Even now, she told me she recalls what she felt that day whenever she peels radishes. My name is Ignacio. I was born in America, but the white kids called me a Mexican. When I was deported to Mexico, the Mexican kids called me a Yankee. I was only a kid. One day, I saw the Wizard of Oz and heard the song, Over the Rainbow. I couldn't stop crying. I wanted to go home where I belong. Today, it's been 75 years, but I still have nightmares. It's a feeling I will have until I die. The government did a very wrong thing. This is Emilio's story. I felt that I didn't need to hide the fact that I could speak English. My dad was pretty proud that we were American citizens and that we didn't belong in Mexico. So my dad said, well, why don't you plan to arrive in your native Los Angeles for your birthday? So I did. It wasn't easy for me to come by myself. I was a young girl, and you know how it is when you're taught to watch out for this guy and to watch out for that guy. Close to the border, Mexican immigration boards the train, and they ask you if you have a tourist visa. So I had to pay the money for a tourist card because, according to them, I was a tourist. Can you imagine me, a tourist, after all those years being born and growing up in Los Angeles? This is a letter of Pablo Guerrero to the US consulate in Mexicali. Dear sir, I hereby make it known that my family and myself were deported into Mexico on December 8th, 1932, on SP trains that left Los Angeles and in view of the fact that all my children were born in the U.S. of A, they do not like Mexican customs and wish to return to the United States in company with their parents. I ask the Los Angeles County authorities as a favor to address the Department of Labor in Washington requesting that the American consulate in Mexicali grant me immigration papers, paying the $18 for each passport. The Mexican government does not give any assistance nor protection to children born in the U.S. of A. And for that reason, I ask that my children and myself be allowed to return to this country in which they were, are entitled to live. These are the experiences of community members I've advised regarding the Muslim ban. A family of Iranian origin sees a dark cloud hover over their impending moments of joy. A young woman, an expectant mother, and a soon-to-be graduate from dental school in Los Angeles. 
Like any daughter, she wants her Iranian citizen mother to witness these pivotal moments of our life. But her mother is prevented from coming simply because of the crime of being born in Iran, anywhere but the United States. Please uh, thank our dramatic reader, Arisa Marina Alvarado. Please say Zira Bayashi, Susan Hayasa, Al Ro, and Ahmad Rafiki. So we would like to provide you with an informal chance to keep the discussion going with our guest speaker at the receptions. So please be seated, let them go down first. That, that, that's kind of an incentive for you to also go to the reception. But um, before we uh, before we excuse you all, I think PJ, you wanted to say something? Tonight you heard a theme of the bell as it resonates, has vibration, that reaches out, it vibrates to your heart, to your mind. And with a lot of cultural traditions, there is the drum, there is also the bell, there is the conch shell. It is a calling of bringing people together. It is a moment to awaken, to call attention, to come in times of solidarity, there's a message to be heard. People come together and listen, using all senses to open. Open minds, open heart, we listen. Now, just not listening, but we now take our minds, our voices, and our action to unite with this vibration to ripple out into our community. So tonight, when you go down to the reception, you will see a temple bell. And we will have two of them. And uh, what you write on your piece of paper, it becomes like a moment of prayer, a moment of wanting to manifest for goodness, so when, as you write and take this downstairs, I invite you, we invite you, to strike the bell because with that mind, that thought will manifest out into the community. And it will be really wonderful to hear the tones of the bell as you are visiting with one another. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I have to add anything to that. So to go to the reception, there are some volunteers who will guide you. You go out the way you came, down the stairs, through the exhibit gallery. And you can take a quick peek, but please come back if you want to look at the exhibit. And then out to the farm, what they call the farm exhibit area. And um, our volunteers will make sure you get there. So thank you all for coming, and we'll see you down the stairs.